the, we had the experience of getting to watch a, a video of an earlier performance. Um, and so one of the things that's interesting to think about there definitely was improvisation here tonight. Uh -huh. So all the brilliant things we've emailed with each other to talk about tonight are gone from my head because it's so vastly different. No, it's not that. But one of the things we talked about was the title. Winners and losers, as Anne pointed out, not uh, winners or losers. And I misremembered it. I was initially telling people I was coming to a play called Winners or Losers, which I think is a significant difference. Well, the logic is usually you're going to be one or the other. Uh, but in fact, uh, the title suggests, um, uh, what does the title suggest? I mean, partly. I mean, this is, one of the things that's so striking is they're, you know, they're invested throughout the performance and it's one or the other. And yet, I mean, you have the, one of the things that Jorge suggested to me that you, in the audience, as we all just were, we get to see both at once. So the and gives the bothness of mm -hmm. the position of winning and losing rather than the zero sum game, which I would argue is a lot, you know, masculinity, normative masculinity does often believe in a certain kind of zero sum game, which is inaccurate to the actual lived existence. Because mm -hmm. uh, Marcus, I think, points out in the piece, uh, we're all going to be weak and vulnerable at some point, right? That's Which the, sucks. It's bad, apparently. Yeah, it doesn't feel so good. Um, so what about uh, masculinity? What, what are we, for me, I mean, the piece makes me feel simultaneously sad uh, uh, and, and also frustrated at sort of the inability to step outside the chalk box. Yes, the Caucasian chalk, <laughs> chalk rectangle. Yeah. Emphasis on Caucasian. Uh, which I assure you is pretty penetrable. Uh, you can step out of it if you want. We're here to tell you you can step out of the chalk box. Um, I think. Uh, I, but the piece seems to insist uh, over and over again uh, that you cannot, that you cannot step out of the, the chalk box. Um, and masculinity, I think, as a site of, um, you know, uh, so much ambivalence, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, we give it so much importance. Uh, some of us are, are drawn to it on, on many, many levels. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, so much of it is uh, uh, bad for you, right? This whole rendition of just walk it off, just walk it off. Uh, bad for you and, and bad for the people around you. In the, I mean, the performance is so fascinating because of the, the circling around of the ways in which masculinity is related to the struggle between them. And I think Marcus is, do I say character? Because there's also that really interesting moment where uh, the character of Jamie refers to himself as a good actor, which makes us wonder about the relationship between the character of Jamie and the actor of portraying him, right? But there's a circling around, but when Marcus, you know, sort of is trying to sort of talk about, for example, the way that when Jamie comes home from tour, this is, you know, you don't examine your privilege, you don't spend time with your children, they need you. What I was actually expecting that moment was like, oh, a proto-feminist critique, you come home from tour. Who's been doing all this labor while you've been away? The wife has. And yet you're out of the bar, you're at the theater, and it's because you feel vulnerable and scared. But I was like, well, actually, no, it's because that's male privilege. You get to be out at the theater or the bar the next night or back at work rather than in the home with your kids. But I felt like so there were these moments of circling around um, sort of how the complexity of what normative masculinity actually requires men to give up, too. But it's almost like in that moment, and it seems like everything in this show, and, and every sort of uh, glimmer of politics, is merely a tactic, mm -hmm. right? So in, in that moment, it's almost as if um, the real attempt there is uh, for Marcus to demonstrate uh, uh, that James is a, a failure at being a certain kind of man. And then uh, Marcus brings up, or uh, James brings up Marcus's wealth, um, uh, which means he's not generating his own wealth, right? He didn't make his own money, uh, which means he's a failure at being another kind of man. Um, but it's hard to take sort of their politics kind of seriously um, because it's all in the context of this kind of uh, jostling for her position. Well, the abrupt shifts also suddenly Pamela Anderson entering the scene. Wasn't that after the 
the part, you know, the, actually the heartbreaking story of the father when it said that we go to Pamela Anderson and their boob jokes. Right. Um, you know, I like boob jokes as much as the next, you know, homosexual. But, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, there are these tonal shifts, which are witty, and as an audience, you know, right. you actually get their off balance too. But um, it does mean that there's a break in a certain kind of political critique. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted more wrestling. Um, <laughs> Speaking of homosexual issues. <laughs> I wanted more wrestling and done at like 50% time. Right, in sort of uh, slow mo. Uh, with an iPhone 6, you can do that. You can achieve that. <laughs> Very easy now. A good actor can achieve that for you. I'm sure they're perfectly. And um, just to bring forward some of the more latent uh, kind of narratives. Well, I actually wanted to ask you about the, the wrestling moment because I was sort of trying to track it. I mean, again, having gotten to see this other performance, but um, the wrestling happens right after Jamie returns from the pee break, which is portrayed as you know, that, that tactic of peeing. And um, I'm always fascinated when, you know, firemen go to restrooms because it's like they're back before they've left. You know, it's like they must start peeing before they actually get into the you restroom. Can do it oh, it up. That does help. <laughs> but I'm like thinking there's something really fascinating. So there's the pee break, which is introduces a tactical diversion from having to engage. Uh -huh. But the moment he comes back from, you know, he's had his hands on his genitals and he comes back, and that's when the wrestling begins. So I'm actually <laughs> thinking about what the transition is. If I got to touch my own junk, too, I'm gonna like grab yours. Right? But I'm not going to grab yours exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you, it's like, like you said, it's like bromance without the romance, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, are the, what are the contexts in which men get to touch each other as well, and it's permitted? So not too many. Yeah. Not too many, uh, apparently. Um, yeah. Um, you, one longs uh, for the men's retreat in the woods, <laughs> uh, where we can put on a, a paint and um, uh, beat a drum and, and take drugs and um, uh, wrestle in slow motion. Oh my god, that was you! That was you! <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get some winners and losers to the audience. I want to hear what were your impressions of what you saw. And the, also just a, you know, sort of the pull of the, I mean, it was an emotional narrative, right? It was sort of, Goes from lighter to darker. And yeah, I'm, I'm especially curious where people uh, sort of ended up emotionally, if, if they can even articulate that. Uh, because for me, the piece is so unsettling, it's, it's hard to even uh, settle on exactly one feeling. You, you mentioned the idea of, of the chalk line, and I think it speaks more to the boxing ring element, mm -hmm. and like the, the, the fight stays within the box, not so much that the, the actor was characters can step in and out, because I think they can, they can freely move, but the fighting in itself remains within this, this zone. I don't, I, I never, I didn't view it as a, as that they couldn't step out, because that, for the sake of the performance, has to stay within the box. Oh, that's so lovely, right? Yeah. I, and I feel like you just explained sports to me, yeah. <laughs> which I've been well, so hungry. <laughs> for years, I haven't understood. I know. Actually, that's true. For years, I have not understood. So that's actually helpful. That's great. I also thought it was interesting, going off what my friend here said, uh, is that during the wrestling, it seemed like their goal was to try to get the other out of the box, that they were trying to push them somehow, like that this space is for intellectual argument, and if you can, like, use your brute force to get them out, then you've somehow won overall. I don't know. I saw that like visually trying to push them out. I think the, uh, I think wrestling is, and again, I don't know anything about sports, but I think it's about submission, right? Like you have to pin the other guy right. down and uh, James does that. Um, uh, I think uh, it's supposed to be uh, humiliating. It was when I was a kid, uh, that's the last time I wrestled. Um, where you got the other guy down and you can sort of like touch his face mm -hmm. and the other guy can't do anything to you. Um. Well, you know, also just thinking, and I mean, I, you know, I'm curious just how choreographed that is and how it changes from night to night, but that moment where, you know, Jamie's pulling Marcus's hand back. So one arm's pulled this way and the other's sort of flailing. But that is basically their embrace, right? There's a way in which Marcus is, in some sense, brought to embrace himself, but they're in contact. So it's really fascinating, again, this sort of the kind of ritualized violence, which is a form of aggression, but also deep affection at that moment, too. Yeah. But the, it's you know, an affection that has to be sublimated into this boxed in you know, form of pummeling. Yeah. And that would also be sports. 
<laughs> yeah, is that, um, I don't to take, is that the way people actually, I know that's the way I experience sports. Uh, I'm always, you know, I'm, uh, and here we are talking about the thing that I hope that we can give less and less attention to. Um, but I, I, what's the uh, heterosexual male experience of sports? <laughs> I guess the whole point is that it has to be so sublimated that you can never understand it as such, right? You have to understand it as sport, as winning or losing. And it's a, I mean, aggression is part of the making. It, and it can be sexual <coughs> aggression. It is, you know, part of also the making of masculinity comes through these aggressive forms of touch. If you just think also schematically, uh, coming out as a varsity athlete in high school and college, um, <laughs> I think schematically that, um, you know, the, the girl who becomes a woman who plays um, a team sport is suspected of being a lesbian. The boy who becomes a man who plays the solo sport is suspect, suspected of being gay. So there's something about Cross country. It, but it's really, I mean, if it's really interesting, <laughs> right? So the girls, women are supposed to participate in the solo sport, which shows off a certain kind of, you know, feminine virtuosity, which is to say the virtuosity of being feminine. Whereas, you know, men have to actually participate with each other, which is like, so that what can they can sort of veil a particular way in which the masculinity is being produced? I mean, the, mm. this is very schematic, and there have been some shifts, but I think it's still the case that a pack of women together are suspected of things that a pack of men together are not. Mm. There is the culture in hockey, certainly after a lot of hockey growing up, competitive hockey when you're a team, um, yet really humble rock inside those dressing rooms, the games, the kind of the hazy rituals, all like it involve anything from the well, classic game that's wet the cracker, which is essentially a circle jerk. Wait, is that true? And there's just no because equivalent in women's athletics. <laughs> and it's like who can reject them first, or it's like peeing on each other in the shower. And those kind of adventures that happen in some of the really high, like the really competitive, not every team does this, but it is, that's, we're seeing through pu puberty, through that kind of confusion of, of gender identification inside of the teen years where they're trying to align themselves. It gets, it gets more confused. Ends up bump padding by the time they football, but, or it, I mean, the pro sports. And what's amazing about that, the sociologist Jane Ward has this great new book coming out called Not Gay, which is actually looking at how, how heterosexual masculinity, and she's making clear this is not about men that are actually in the down low, men that would come out, they just haven't found the language yet, like that heterosexual masculinity, white heterosexual masculinity, is constituted through these kinds of what seem from one perspective deeply homoerotic play, um, which continues from, like, through many, and this frat parties often have um, initiations ritualized, sort of quote, homosexual activities, and how to think about this as producing, you know, Heter white heterosexual masculinity depends upon what, from one perspective, looks really queer, but it gets actually straight. It's so it's a fascinating book, but I mean, this is I you're speaking it. to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's fascinating to me is that I thought that those scenarios were all inventions of gay pornography, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and now uh, I'm hearing the fact. Well, you know they come from Canada. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although this raises an yeah, maybe this is a Canadian issue. Yeah. <laughs> raises a deliciously ambiguous chicken and egg question. Um, yeah, who, who invented them first? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say we don't know. I'm going to say it's a mystery. It's a chicken and egg. What's going to come after this? <laughs> <laughs> any other thoughts about this? Please. So were there any points in the play that were really sort of red light flashing, you know, about any sort of any other topics that you guys look at in your own research that you think, oh, hang on, this is like a, a danger point? I mean I, I mean, I was really interested in the, I guess, what, what are the emotional ranges permissible? Or, or what emotional range is permissible? So you've got sad contrasted with angry, and they're not so opposed, sadness and anger. One mm -hmm. can think of sadness as actually the introversion of anger, a turning of anger against oneself, like the, the melancholy that you beat yourself up from within because you feel uh, you cannot it, express it in the world. Um, and so it's interesting to think which subjects get to, are given the social permission to express their anger mm. and which are not. So, you know, the, uh, I mean, I think there's a way in which the question of racial difference was very much in the performance, even if not talked about explicitly, but it makes sense that there's a racial melancholy, immigrant experience and also being, um, and how, sort of, how does whiteness get to articulate itself as opposed to mm. those who are marked as other? And I just thought so much about uh, capitalism, right, which is the ultimate winners and losers game, uh, 
where, uh, and you know, a system that um, has had uh, such a profound uh, geographic uh, impact on our city. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, and news for Vancouver suggests uh, up there as well, uh, a system that is you know, so globally uh, hegemonic um, and that we still can't figure out uh, a way out of uh, to such an extent that in the piece, even Marcus's uh, political organizing is asked to answer to the same winners or losers kind of logic. You know, well, how many seats did you win in the last election? Um, and uh, that's uh, sort of sobering. Um, and the, yeah. Well, there's the, this is um, just thinking of the, the one time in this performance where the word fuck is said, right? I mean, so in some sense, the most explicitly sexual term is used, even though that term is so colorful, it floats across into non-sexual registers, right? But it comes after actual dollar amounts are said for the first time. So money's being talked about, class is being talked about, capitalism, but that, um, the moment at which fuck you is said from Marcus to Jamie is the moment at which actual dollar amounts are put to their salaries. And this, so I think that, that was really fascinating to think about mm -hmm. what the currencies of exchange, um, yeah. the transmutation of money into, which, it, you know, which is also, Right, I'm sorry, I'm thinking with psychoanalysis now, like the like shitting is actually the first currency the child offers to the parent. <laughs> and it lays in. It, and it's all, but this is talk of anal eroticism earlier, right? So I mean, we have permission to do this. Yes, 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 right? yes, yes, yes. Um, So that shitting's like the first currency the child offers. And then it becomes the basis of, you know, the child gets rewarded for that, the basis of all sorts of, you know, sort of, it gets refigured as sort of gift, this money is gold, right? This is basic, you know. Freud. But so, but if we think about this in terms of capitalism, who's like whose labor is shit, and who's gets turned into gold, and we so we get fuck you after dollar signs are said. Mm. Like it's sort of okay, like, hey, this this you know money into shit back into the you know, currency of the body. It's such a great you know the whole piece is such a great um, you know provocation, and uh, for me it's almost like uh, under ideal circumstances is uh, only the the sort of the prologue right to the evening. Um, you know, it, it, it leaves me feeling uh, sort of uh, very uh, emotionally unsettled uh, and, you know, uh, it, in some ways uh, newly reacquainted uh, with what's uh, unsatisfying about the present uh, in so many ways. And, uh, uh, and I hope then invites us to start thinking about, uh, well, uh, how, how much uh, do we like this? Uh, and, and what are the sort of the moments of uh, slow wrestling pleasure available there? Uh, and, and sort of what else might we imagine? What else might we be able to, um, how many more ands might we add to the title? Because our, our desires, our capacity to imagine are so well, capitalized. Even I, one, I think my favorite scene might have been the masturbation competition. Uh, <laughs> um, even that. Even that, well, yes, because you know, the, you know, Jamie gives a scenario of sitting in front of the computer, he's got these, you know, scenes queued up, but this is like, did, well, I don't mean the pun, but what the hell, digitized masturbation, right? You've got the digital, it's queued up, but, you know, here, here it is. Um, and, but, so we've got the screen all, and, you know, but how, what are the forms of representation of capital that actually tell us how we're supposed to desire now? Right. But that is a scene, it's utterly, it's totally mediated by these new forms of the distribution of desire. And you know a lot of these, a lot of porn sites. Maybe you were, you know, maybe this, your character is like creatively manipulating images, but a lot of you know sites are also you know paying money. But um, so yeah, our our imagination, our sexual imagination, has a dollar sign on it. Yeah. And that can be sexy, but um, it also limits what we get to imagine. Although a clever masturbator will tell you there are plenty of free. Uh, <laughs> Good. <time. laughs> The master of masturbation. <laughs> uh, which might suggest people are not getting paid, uh, which is also depressingly familiar, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So, I thought there was something very much like the frustration of the this idea of, of like your car, your hands already been dealt, so like the decision's already been made, and so what you're arguing about is. It's already done. You're already fit. You're already in this fixed position. 
And there's just something so extremely frustrating about that. It almost seems unanswerable when I think that's seen in the, the, the whole politics element of it all. And I just found it very frustrating in a, in a, in a good way. But I mean, it gets back, it's, that's really lovely. It gets back to the end. Yeah. And maybe even connects to what you pointed out earlier about are we in a, how set is this rectangular box we're in? And think about the and. I mean, there, we, I mean, this is in some sense the experience of, dare I say, human freedom, right? That freedom is not absolute. So we're, we're given into a set of conditions we didn't choose. None of us chose, chose to be born, for starters. But we're given into a set of conditions none of us chose. There are structural conditions we also are, are put into by virtue of race, class, gender, um, sexual desire. And so the, there are these things we couldn't choose, and yet within that, how do we how do we choose from within constraint? And this is, you know, it's so often posed as free will versus determinism, but it's it's not it's not simple like that. It's it's an and, it's both. It might be what's learned from that confrontation of, of the confrontation of the, the fact that it's a social it's a it's a linear structure. And I feel like a lot of what they were talking about was this question of is there is there agency? Yeah. Right? And what and, and, and who and what does that look like? I mean, you know, just so the extent that one is, yes, people are relatively privileged in relation to, you know, you can be privileged with respect to race, but not with respect to class. So there's an and there too. But um, to that, because that also becomes a zero sum game. It makes it seem as if there's n that we are so absolutely determined that we that we can just give up, get shrug, or we can switch topics from discussing, I don't know, um, political uh, capitalism to Pamela Anderson, because what's the point? They're e they're of equal weight. And I, I, I take Pamela Anderson very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> she is one of Canada's many gifts to the United States. <laughs> Anne Murray, another wonderful <laughs> songbird of Canada. <laughs> the piece, it's, it's so great because it, it, you know, it happens within the context, of course, of a, of a theatrical stage. And uh, the piece recognizes or admits at the end uh, that they're going to do it again. Right? And so there's this question of, will it, will it be very different? Um, and is there, uh, is there even a desire, right, for it to be sort of very different? And there's something about that repetition um, and this question of uh, how much of the show is improvised, how much of the show is scripted, uh, that I think raises uh, really beautifully and in a really embedded way this question of agency. Yes, right, yeah, the structured improvisation yeah. every day. Yeah. yeah, and then structured improvisation that seems to end up in the same place. Well, that was wonderfully optimistic and cheerful. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well then, yeah. So that's my question. How do we, uh, sorry, we stole your props. Uh, for borrows. I frisk us because we're going to take the bells with us. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> that was easy. Uh, so I, I for, I've forgotten my point, I guess. But um, They're coming back to the same place and yet it's a different place. Oh, uh, uh, it, if the game always starts the same way, right? So the game, there's been a conversation before the show that we have not been privy to. Because State of the Union was very up to the minute, clearly, the yeah. State of the Union address. Absolutely, but there's the, the conversation I'm referring to is the conversation to play the game called Winners and Losers, right? Uh, right, because we enter into that. We never show right. what determines that, they're going to, that you're going to play this game, or the characters are going to play this game. Yep. Can we put you on the spot and ask some questions? Because yeah, yeah. um, Raphael was telling us beforehand that, uh, among other things, there have been discussions. What would it mean to have other pairs do a version of this yeah. play, including, I guess, audiences have asked before, what would it mean to have two women doing it? Yes. And I admit, I couldn't imagine. I mean, it would have to shift because they, they couldn't be you, but I actually I found it hard to imagine what it would mean to have sort of two you know, self-identified women doing this winners and losers game. It would, what would be the tone of it? It's it seems this seems like such a masculine. It does. It's like yeah, uh, we've always thought it was super masculine, as in, in many ways, like an exercise in exploring masculinity or in some way. Um, but we have like we actually are really curious, genuinely curious about what it would mean. We actually have in mind two women from Vancouver performers um, that we imagine could uh, take take our places particularly because the kind of diagonal intersection of class and race is the same for them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but I, I don't think that, like it wouldn't be a question of giving them this script, uh, because it is a script and it does, it is more or less the same every night. Like it is more like a real play than it feels like it is. 
Um, uh, yeah, that's our that's style, right? Like that's the aesthetic. That's the aesthetic we're chasing. I mean, there are obviously things that are improvised, but but the structure is is the same. Um, but they would have to embark on a creation process. I, we think that would might be simple. Like it would be about working on the creation, kind of the creation model we used, as opposed to taking our words and then just take, you know, they, that wouldn't make any sense, I don't think. But, hugely curious about tone, about how, how, like, what it means to win is gonna be different, well, for any two individuals, but we suspect particularly, you know, across gender or across, who, who knows what else? It, like, tactics, all that stuff, which it po probably change. And with the women, women that I was thinking both would risk being seen as really bitchy, in a way, potentially in a way that yeah, no, I know. it would be the same space. Right? Like, it'd be so interesting because it's like, yeah, or with the game change. Like, mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe the game changes in some way we can't actually imagine right now because this is just how Jamie and I played it. And we didn't think we were making up a show. We thought we were, I mean, we thought we were doing a warm-up game. Like it wasn't, it, it wasn't conscious writing at first. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting question, but looked at another way, are, aren't we all fluent in the language of winners and losers, yes. and aren't we all fluent in the language of masculinity, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and in that logic. Uh, when, you're, like, when you were thinking, oh, who are the, 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 these women uh, performers that you were thinking of, I thought, oh, are their names Margaret Thatcher and Angela Merkel by chance? Right. <laughs> uh, um, I, well, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I definitely see. That. Uh, Especially both were played by Meryl Streep. Uh, <laughs> like at the same time. It would be so awesome. Yeah. Just yeah. Back for yes. <laughs> Her accent shifts would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the ping pong <laughs> That would have to be in slow mo for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much. This is terrific. Uh, this has been a real pleasure for me. Thank you.